So they can probably send 3D images to each other. Uh, they might be able to send uh, maps or pictures to each other. Um, now blue whales can communicate for very long distances and um, they're so loud that they're probably the, the loudest mammal on the planet. Um, they can communicate at 180 decibels, meaning um, they're louder than anything else in the world or any other kind of animal. Um, and because of uh, noise pollution, they can probably only communicate about 160 kilometers. Um, and now whales migrate thousands of miles, and they probably have some way to uh, recognize geographical features in the ocean using sound. So they remember how certain things sound, and so when they get to certain markers, then they can uh, change their migration course. And they can also swim, uh, swim in, in tandem with each other. Right. So sound waves are longitudinal, meaning the air is moving, uh, moving backwards and forwards in the direction of motion. So as sound waves are traveling, they're going like this. Um, now, um, one thing that we can do with sound waves, and this is sort of similar to my own experiments in quantum computing, but uh, since sound is waves, we can do it with sound as well as with quantum computer. But um, I have a tuning fork here, you probably played with tuning forks before, and when you hit it, uh, they vibrate at a, cer at a certain frequency. So this is 480 hertz, um, and what's happening is the, uh, the tuning fork is vibrating really quickly, and so it's producing the sound. Now, I have something here called a signal generator. Um, this produces a an AC signal that vibrates at whatever frequency you tell it to. So I can get this at 480 hertz. Okay, so if I want to tune my tuning fork. And I have a speaker here. Okay, so I can produce sounds electronically. I can make them on my computer, or I can use a signal generator. Make it louder. Okay, so that's from my um, that's from my speaker, and if I hit my tuning fork, now if I change this a little, so if my frequency of my speaker is a little bit different then you can hear beats. Okay. Huh? So if you want a lower frequency, then we can just adjust our frequency here. So the lowest frequency that human beings can hear is about 20 hertz. Um, anything below this, and it gets really, really hard. So do you guys listen, you probably all listen to digital music, right? Well, one of the things they do with digital music is to make it smaller, um, they actually delete some of the higher frequency notes. So. Um, some people like to listen to music on vinyl records because when you have a vinyl record, it's a recording of the noise. Uh, but when you digitize the music, then what they did, I think um, maybe it was Apple, whoever invented MP3s, they decided we're going to make the files smaller and so we're going to cut off everything above 16,000 hertz. And so if you do that, then uh, you lose some of the frequencies at the very top, but it's debatable about whether you can, whether you can even hear it or not. So let's do a hearing check, okay? So.
This is about a thousand hertz. Pretty much everybody can hear it. So if I go to say 3,000 hertz, you can still hear it. Um, let's go up. It is really annoying. Okay? So this is 10,000 hertz. Can you guys hear that? Who can hear? OK. Still hear it, OK. So can you still hear this? Uh, it's getting pretty quiet, I'll, I'm not going to lie. You can still hear it? I can barely hear it. I can't really hear it. So I'm going to go up. You can? OK. It is, OK, I'll turn it down. How about 16,000? Can you guys still hear this? Yeah. I, I can't. I can't hear it. What about eight, uh, 17,000? You can hear that? Is it louder? OK, sorry. We're almost done. What about 18,000? Raise your hand if you can still hear it. A little, OK. What about now? Eight, 18,000? You hear that? I, I can't hear it. Okay. Go up to, say, 19,000. Can you hear it? Does it make your brain hurt? Okay. Okay. So, and then um, this is 20,000. Can anybody still hear this? Yeah, we're starting to get uh, above uh, what humans can hear. So the idea is with your digital music, if you're really a true purist, music purist, if you listen to digital music, they say that's not actually music. Because anything above 16,000 hertz, they just throw away. They delete it. Uh, huh? Um, they might, I, I have it down, they might, they mostly they cut off the high frequency stuff because then they can take out a huge bandwidth and it's debatable about whether you can even hear it or not. Um, so, yes? Are people who are complaining about it not being like your music older generations because they can't even hear Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, certain audio, audio purists say only vinyl records are actually music. Because if you convert it into digital music, right, you're taking a sound and you're turning it into a series of ones and zeros on a computer, and then you're playing it back. So, you know, anytime you do that, you're going to lose something. Um, other people say, well, that's, that's kind of crazy talk, right? I mean, what difference does it make? It sounds exactly the same. Most people probably can't tell. So, but there, there are people that only buy vinyl records, and they, they, they swear by them, so. Um, now, okay. So, now here, I, I have two tuning forks, okay? Now, if you've, if you've heard, you, might have, you may have heard this in the news that um, there were certain people at the at government agencies that supposedly had all these health issues, and they say it was some kind of secret ultrasonic weapon meaning they were exposed to some high-frequency noise and it actually caused brain damage, okay? So some conspira conspiracy theorists believe this. I don't know if it's true, but the idea was is that you, if you can direct enough energy at a frequency that you, want, you can't hear, right? So say if it was 32,000 hertz, right? Well, that energy is still being transmitted. So if you could make it loud enough, maybe you could make some kind of weapon. So you could, I don't know... I mean, they, I don't know if they go deaf or maybe uh, uh, cause some kind of brain damage. So this was, this was in the news. I, I don't think it's ever been proven. Uh, I don't know if they, there is such a thing. Now, when I was a kid, they, uh, I, I did go to a religious school, and they always said that rock and roll was bad. Have you, did, you guys, did you guys ever grow up with that? Okay. Well, it was conservative. And so they'd show us this video about how evil rock and roll was, and as proof of that, they would put an egg by a speaker in a concert. And at the end of the concert, the egg was actually hard-boiled. And so I've never tried this, but, uh, but it, uh, it, it demonstrates that you can actually, uh, using the transfer of energy, you could actually cook the egg. 
So it would be an experiment, uh, interesting experiment to try. So if any of you are going to a concert in the near future, please take an egg with you and stick it by the speaker, and then come back and report to us, because I would, I would really like to see if that was true. In the video it did. He broke it up and he's like, look, it's hard-boiled. Rock and roll is evil, but no, it's, it's just energy. So um, now... Uh, sound waves are a wave as you, as you, as the air starts to vibrate, the pressure changes where it's vibrating, um, and it, it needs a medium to propagate through. So I mentioned this before, if you're a fan of Star Wars or Star Trek, um, all the space battles are wrong because they should all be completely silent. So when Luke, fight, Luke Skywalker is blowing up the Death Star, well, actually, it would maybe there would be an explosion, but you wouldn't hear anything, right? No laser battles, no sounds. Um, so if you evacuated a bell jar, uh, if you put a bell inside of an evacuated chamber and you tried to ring it, it would be totally quiet because sound requires air to propagate, okay? Now, sound travels differently through different mediums. So the denser a medium is, um, the faster sound propagates through it, okay? So if you compare the velocity of water and air, then uh, sound will travel much faster through water, okay? So uh, if you've ever been scuba diving, you can't tell what direction the sound is actually moving or coming from um, because it travels from one ear to the other so quickly that... Um, notice that you can see the explosion much uh, quicker than you can actually hear it. That's because the velocity of light is much higher than sound. So the velocity of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, whereas sound travels at 0.343 kilometers per second. Okay? So we talked about this before. Uh, if you see the flash and then you count, so uh, if you, you'll hear it a second or two later, and you can use this to get the distance from things. So like with lightning, if you want to know how far away lightning was, then if you count to five, um, every five seconds it's the, the lightning was one mile away. So if you see a flash, you count to five, and then you hear the thunder, um, then it was one, one mile away. Okay, so let's look at the, the velocity of uh, waves or sound waves traveling through different medium. So if we had a wave, then the velocity was related to the tension in a string. So it was the tension divided by um, the mass per unit length. Okay? For thin solid rods, you can have uh, Young's modulus, so this, um, and that is E divided by rho. Okay? Then, uh, this, so this is for solids. Okay? And if you are an engineer, um, there, uh, of course, people have studied materials for a long time, and so there are tables of every kind of material. There's uh, Young's modulus, and then for gases, there's also the bulk modulus, okay? Uh, now, the bulk modulus is, uh, it tells us about the compressibility of a substance. So it, me it measures how resistant is something to being compressed. Certain materials are squishier than other things, um, water is not very compressible. Um, gases are compressible. So, for example, if you had shock absorbers on your car, you probably would not want them to be full of water because um, it would basically be like you were just riding on cement and there were no shock absorbers. So people use uh, gas in their shock absorbers, and um, gas is uh, compressible. Okay. All right, so let's look at the velocity of sound compared to solids, gas, and uh, liquids. So uh, solids have the highest velocity of sound waves, then it's liquids, 
and then it's gases. Okay? And this has to do with uh, the tension or the force between it. So you have something that's uh, um, very stiff, then sound is going to travel faster through it. Okay? okay, so let's look at an example of a piston. And we want to look at uh, how we can derive what the speed of sound is to, uh, if we uh, through a particular gas. Okay, so imagine we have a piston and we hit the top of it with some kind of force. And so as we press down on the piston, then we're going to have a pressure wave that travels through our solid at a particular velocity. Okay? So pushing down on the piston with the speed of Vp will move the fluid element in front of it with the speed of V. Okay? So if I hit it with a hammer, okay, then uh, the piston is going to move down a certain velocity, and also this element of volume will also be displaced. And it will also have a velocity, but it will be different than the piston. Pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. So if you apply a force over a certain area, then you get a greater pressure. Um, so if I, uh, if I were to push, on, push against you with a, a little pen as compared to something big, it would uh, create more pressure. So you, want to, you would want it spread out over a bigger area. Then, so we have pressure is equal to force divided by area. And we can always substitute for pressure, or for force, m equals a, so mass times acceleration. So now we have uh, the mass times acceleration divided by the area. And um, of course, acceleration is equal to the velocity divided by the change in time. The velocity is from our piston. So as we apply, as a, the velocity of our piston is changing over a certain amount of time, that's going to give us an acceleration. So if I hit my piston, the velocity is changing. So I can substitute in for acceleration, and I get uh, mass times the velocity of the piston divided by the area, and A is area, so that's the surface area of my piston. Okay? So it depends on uh, how big your piston is. That's this area right here. So my surface. Um, now we want to know what M is, okay? So how much, what's the mass of this area here, so of our, our section here? How much mass is contained in this area that's moving? Um, we're just considering this little slice of liquid, right, or gas inside of our piston. So um, we can write the mass as the, the density times the volume. Okay, so that will give us the, the mass. So we, uh, if we know what the density of water is, then we can multiply that times the volume or the density of air. Um, now we can write the volume as the surface area times the length. So little l will be the length of the height of, our, uh, of this little slice of fluid. So that will be um, our volume there. And so we'll substitute this back into our expression for pressure. So I have this new expression. I'm going to put it in here for the mass. And now I'll get pressure is equal to the density of my fluid or liquid times the surface area of the piston times L, so my height here L, times the velocity of the piston divided by area of the piston times delta t. So now I get this nice expression here, well, um, which is equal to my pressure. So rho equals L times Vp over delta t. And um, people have done this for, for probably every imaginable type of gas. Um, and you can look up in tables um, 
what the bulk modulus is, what the velocity of sound is through the materials. Okay. So, um, L, so as the piston is coming down, then we're going to have this little piece of fluid that gets displaced, and um, it's going to have some height L. And so we can replace L by velocity times delta T. And so we'll get the pressure is equal to rho times L times the velocity of the piston divided by delta T. So if we substitute in for um, VP, we'll have V times delta T over delta T. And we end up with the density times the velocity of our little slice of fluid um, times the velocity of our piston is equal to our pressure. Okay, so let's skip ahead. I'm not going to go through all this. But we end up with our um, the velocity of sound through the liquid is equal to the bulk modulus divided by the density of the liquid. Okay, so um, I will upload the um, PowerPoint into Blackboard, and so if you would like to, you can read through it, but I don't want to sit here and read it to you off the screen. Instead, I would rather do some more experiments. Okay. Hopefully my box doesn't break. Okay. So, let's get out of this. Okay. So, up here on the table, I have two tuning forks. Okay. And these two tuning forks are sitting on a wooden box. So um, what you can do is, now the tuning forks act like a resonator for a particular sound waves. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this tuning fork, and um, it's going to start vibrating. And inside of here, my wooden box is sort of like an instrument. It will conduct sound waves through to the other side. And the sound waves will go and they'll interact with this other tuning fork over here. And then um, I can make this other tuning fork over here start rain. So if I hit this one. So if I let it go for long enough, I'll hit it a bunch. Then if I put my ear up here, oh, well, you can't hit it with the, with the ear. Okay, I'll try it again. All right, so I'm going to get a lot of energy. So I can hear this one vibrating. Okay? So I, I obviously hit it too hard, but oops, OK. I can still hit it. OK. Now, um, another, so what's happening is, if you believe this experiment, is that I have, I have started this tuning fork vibrating. As it's vibrating, the sound waves travel over here, and then they interact with this tuning fork. This tuning fork has a resonance frequency at the same energy as this one, the same frequency. And so this one will actually start vibrating. And so what you can do is you can actually have energy transferring between these two different tuning forks. Um, now, if these tuning forks were qubits, this is sort of similar to something that happens inside of a quantum computer. So as you excite one qubit, you can bring it into resonance with another qubit, and the other qubit will also get excited. And then you'll have energy passing back and forth between the two tuning forks, and you'll have some type of uh, shared state between these two. Okay. Uh, now, so I have this tuning fork, and it is, um, 
at 480 hertz. Okay. I'm going to turn this back on again. Turn it up. Well, if I could apply enough energy to my speaker, I could um, I could actually make my tuning sort my tuning fork start to vibrate as well. So I could excite it with my speaker, and then uh, I could make the tuning fork start buzzing. So. Now, another thing you can do is, since the uh, sound waves are waves, it's possible for you to have interference in time and also interference in space. Okay? So I'm going to hook up two speakers together. Okay? So, as I move my two speakers, do you hear anything happening to the, the volume? Okay, so do you hear anything happening to the intensity? What what happens to the intensity as I move it? Yeah, so the intensity um, as I move the speakers. So I have two speakers right here together. The speakers are hooked to one source, a signal generator, so it's a coherent source. That means their, um, their um, oscillations are in phase with each other, right? And if you do this, then you can hear, you can hear changes in the intensities. So I'll try and bring it over here. So it's bouncing off the walls, or? So it, it does bounce off the walls, that's true. You could, have, um, you could have interference probably with yourself. Actually, let's see if that works. So let's turn our speakers back on here.
That actually does work. So as I as I get louder and as I get closer to the wall or change the distance, it's really loud and then it gets quiet again. Okay. So now the other time I had the speakers facing you guys. Okay. So why what uh, what would be happening then that would make it get quieter and softer? So you mentioned that um, the waves are lining up, right? So like, so what do you mean, like? Yes. All right. So that is you're right. So if I have two speakers here, and I draw the sound waves coming out of them in all directions, I'll draw this one here, and then I draw the sound waves from the other one. So, wherever the waves line up with each other, so at the maximum here, if you're standing in this position, then it will appear to sound louder. And that's because we have uh, constructive interference. If you're in a position here, where you have a minimum of one wave, and then a maximum of the other wave, so that would be destructive interference. Right? So, it can happen, uh, with you as a function of distance from a wall. So as you get closer, then um, the waves are going to be bouncing back off of the wall. Uh, whenever sound hits a wall, it of course bounces back. And so um, inside of your apartment, right, if you have a stereo in there, then um, you're going to have sound waves bouncing off of everything, the furniture and the floors. And depending on how you uh, arrange your furniture, you can actually have uh, the sound waves in such a way that you might have minimums in certain areas. So if you're trying to make a really good home entertainment system, then you want to get a really high-end stereo that can actually make a, a sonic map of your apartments. And then the, the speakers can actually compensate for all of the furniture in your apartment, and so it sound, it has the same volume everywhere in your apartments. Right? So, but um, as I move the cart by you, then if you're sitting right here, then um, areas of constructive and destructive interference will be moving by you. And so um, depending on where you're sitting, it will either sound louder or quieter. 